Um, so we're just gonna jump in. So listen, I know I talk fast. I really am working on it. But that's why we're recording this. So you can go back and you know find the places where I talk too fast, okay? Um, so uh, I'm gonna pray really quick and then I'm gonna get us started. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, uh, that you have sustained your church through time. You promised us that the gates of hell would not prevail over your bride, and we're grateful for that, Lord, and um, we just, we thank you, Lord, that you have continued to move through the centuries, that um, Switzerland Community Church weren't the first ones to figure it out, Lord. Um, so we pray for um, uh, just a, a posture of learning, that we would learn from uh, what, what our brothers and sisters in the faith have gone through, uh, maybe some humility uh, and some grace as maybe we look at some of their mistakes, uh, but uh, with our eyes set firmly on Christ and his promise that uh, his bride would be presented before him um, blameless. So we thank you, Lord, for the gift of your church uh, and to be a part of it. And so we just pray that you would use this time for your glory and, and that you would edify us for your use. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I'm not Dr. Reeves. I don't know if you know that. Um, but, uh, but I can say that his teaching... Um, changed my life. Uh, I was a much different person beforehand. I, I, had, I, I had no concept of church history before I met him. I just figured, hey, like, everything was bad for 1,500 years, then Luther kind of did okay, and then Billy Graham came along and we started to figure it out. <laughs> right? And, and that's not fair. So, so my task tonight is to get us to the Crusades. And here, I want to state my goal. I want Christians to be able to speak about the Crusades confidently and intelligently. A lot of times, Christians, when they enter the marketplace, we kind of just, you know, the crusades get brought up and Christians go, yeah, oh, I know, yeah, we did that, right? Because we're not always able to articulate how we got there, what was the context, what was the situation, why were the decisions made that were made, other than kind of the popular narrative, which is, Oh, look, look how awful Christianity can be stealing land from the peaceful Muslims. Um, this is not going to be Muslim bashing, but it is going to be an honest assessment uh, of the historical past. So, so where did we end? We ended about the Council of Nicaea last time. Is that right? The first council of, of the church. So that's going to be important to our context, okay? So I'm going to take us to the Crusades as succinctly as, as I possibly can. So... Um, what Constantine embodied, right, was, the, was the, the, the joining of church and state. It was the first major experiment in, in that philosophy. It had never been tried before um, on a grand scale. Constantine united the, the Eastern world with the Western world, um, became emperor, and Christendom, the kingdom of, of Christianity, was, was taken over in both. But the life of the church um, wasn't always right on par with what Constantine wanted to do. And after his death, um, the church continued to be focused in the east, focused in Constantinople, right here, primarily. While the governance of the world was focused here in the west. Now, the reaction to Constantine's philosophy that Christianity is going to make all of the decisions, um, what you started to see was your learned Christians, right, th those who really studied the Bible, for the most part, um, took off. They didn't want to be a part of this plan where Christianity was making all the laws. So monasticism, this idea that Christians would step aside from society developed because, as a direct result of the way Constantine wanted to marry church and state. Your monk said, that's, that's not the way things should be done, and they retreated. Um, that's an interesting concept as we think about America, which is in some ways a revisiting of Constantine's idea of a Christian-governed land. It might be the gut reaction for Christians to step back, to step aside from society, which had pluses and minuses. So during this time, down here at the north of Africa, you begin to see these communities of, of monks start to form. Um, and and the, the time of the Desert Fathers uh, came about. These, these monk communities that were hidden away in the desert where they would leave society to go find wisdom. 
And this is where all the great writing, the great wisdom of the church started to develop. So meanwhile, the culture of, of Europe and Asia Minor, um, it, it began to be this weird amalgam of how the church makes decisions for the state and vice versa. Well, the problem with that is um, languages, right? Because the, the West is going to be primarily speaking Latin, and the East is going to be primarily speaking Greek. And eventually, over time, even though there was a closeness under Constantine, without that super strong leadership, we're going to see that divide start to happen again. But right now, at the end of Constantine, what you see is a worldwide church. This is going to be really important, okay? The church um, viewed itself, uh, did, did Ryan draw for you the, the flower thing? I'm going to draw for you the flower thing. You're like, what are you talking about? What are you? Um, there's this idea that if this is Jerusalem, the church is, has three petals. Those petals being Europe, Asia, and Africa, with Jerusalem in the middle. And that's the whole flower. That is the whole of Christianity. But eventually, uh, we're going to get to six, the, the late 600s, and, and what major precipitating event happened in the 650s, 680s? Anybody know? Islam. Muhammad. Muhammad changed the world. And as we, as we march forward to the Crusades, which is in, in the, the late 10s, um, so 400 years earlier, Muhammad started a precedent that, that impacted this pedal idea. Okay? And here's what he did. Muhammad erased two petals through conquest. Like, I'm not making any comment on Islam itself. That's another class for another day. Okay, but historically, politically, you cannot argue that Islam cut off the petals. This entire region, all of this, right, was full of Christians. Having nothing to do with Constantine, because even before Constantine, Christians were occupying this area, this, the entire flower was filled with Christianity. That's just, it flourished. It, it, it's a phenomenon that the world had never seen, that Christianity spread through, through the gospel, not by the sword. Now, a lot of these guys kind of on the outskirts in the Asian and African parts, um, they, they might not be, be as cosmopolitan as what's happening in Rome and Constantinople, right? They, they might not have as refined of a faith, uh, but they still were Christian. But when Muhammad came, um, he ruled by the sword. His history will paint him as a warlord. Having nothing to do with the religion, he conquered consistently. And, and at least in his initial conquests, that was all done by the sword. It was convert or die. Now, we're going to talk a little bit later about the, the alleged peaceful Muslim occupation of Spain, but we're not quite there yet. But what's key for us to understand is that that this area, okay, right here, where, where Jerusalem's right here, all of Syria, all of Lebanon, all of Saudi, and even, I mean, during this time, we had missionaries going all the way to China. Before the 600s, we had missionaries going to China. When Marco Polo later would be the first Westerner, right, to, to breach, the, breach the, the Asian continent and get to China, he met Christians there which is kind of funny, because we kind of think as Marco Polo as being the first one. Not even close. Not even close. Christianity had spread naturally that far. And especially in this area, we, we, there's a community called the Syriac Christians. Okay? This is their, their heritage. They're not, they're not Arab. Um, they, they don't speak Arabic. They're Syriac. Um, their theology is a little off. It's not quite what we're seeing in Rome. Right, so at the Council of Nicaea, which we talked about last week, or the week before, yeah, right? Week before. The Council of Nicaea, the big argument was against, who were we arguing against at Nicaea? Anybody remember? Arianism, right? Arianism is this idea that Jesus is not co-equal with the Father, that Jesus is a created being, right? So Arianism was a heresy that began to take over the, the north, the Goths and the Visigoths and the Germanic tribes, and that was influencing the church. Well, if we're going to ask the question, are the Aryans saved or not, I don't know the answer to that question, 
But overall, you could say that they're, they're Christian in nature. Well, the Syriac Christians, their theology wasn't quite the same as our theology, but mostly the same. They had a little different view of uh, Scripture. They're, they were using nearly the same text as us, but not exactly the same text as us. We're translation errors that were adopted into their religion. So Rome kind of ignored them a little bit, right? So when they're down here saying, hey, um, there's this new warlord on the scene, and he's kind of taken over, um, Rome largely ignored them and let it happen, right? Like we, Rome had the forces to, to fight Muhammad, but because the Syriac Christians weren't in line with the Council of Nicaea's decisions, they were ignored and they were allowed to be killed, eradicated for the most part. Um, there are some stories of small Christian communities that maintained during the time, but uh, th for the most part, they were killed. So why does that matter? Because by the time we get to the late 10 hundreds when the Crusades happen, understand this, that the, the mindset of the church at that time is that these were Christian lands first. Now, this is not taking it, the, the Jewish part into the equation, okay? That they're just not thinking about that. But the first thing I want you to get about the Crusades is that it, this is a, a story of retaking and rescuing those under oppression. That's how the war started. We're, we're told over and over again by pop culture and the media that the Crusades is all about Christian aggression. That is, that is nowhere near the historical context. They were rescuing those who had been taken advantage of uh, at the point of the sword, okay? So that's the first big point I want us to get as we look at the, um, as we look at the Crusades. Now, um, at the Council of Nicaea, um, in the Nicaean Creed, we have this phrase that the Spirit proceeds from the Father. Anybody know their Nicaean Creed very well? The Spirit proceeds from the Father. Is there more to that sentence? Anyone know? From the Father and the Son. That language is very important. Okay? Now, in the original Nicene Creed, this phrase did not exist the and the Son. It was just that the Spirit proceeds from the Father. Now, if you're thinking about it in terms of Scripture, that holds up scripturally pretty well. But when you hold that up to what the church was dealing with in the north, with Arianism, Arianism, which says Jesus was created by the Father, this simple phrase that the Spirit proceeds only from the Father takes on a different light. I'll draw it for you. I'm going to draw in Africa, okay? You guys get that this is Africa. I don't need this area anymore. So the Spirit, according to the Arian view, which is a big deal, proceeds from the Father, and so does the Son. The Arians would say, here is a line, that line being between the Creator and the created thing. Now that's, let me move my stuff so you guys can see. So that has an impact on your theology, a big impact. Is the son of the same substance as the father? If Jesus created all things, which Colossians clearly tells us, he cannot be a created thing. And, and this may not sound like a big deal, but this is hundreds of years of the biggest deal. Right? This, this matters very distinctly. So later, Rome, the Pope sitting in Rome, is going to say, let's go back and change the creed to say something more clear, that the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. So what that looks like is, Father, Son, Spirit. Now, while this is not the, the clearest expression of the Trinity, and it isn't, um, it does put Jesus in the realm of creator, 
which is better theology. Okay, a lot of times when you're looking at history, we gotta be patient with our, our brothers and sisters from times past, and we can't grab them and say, you don't have right theology. Let's look at them on, on a scale of better or worse theology, okay? So here's what happened. The Pope in Rome unilaterally said, this is the way we're doing it. He added the phrase, and the son. Now, in our minds looking back, we go, yeah, that's, that's what popes do. So what, right? The pope can do that. Well, in our understanding of Catholicism today, yeah, that's true. But back then, we did not have the split that we have today between the Catholic world and what we call today the Orthodox world. So this, this event was the final thing that split East and West forever. This is called the Great Schism. The Great Schism. So I gotta back up to explain why 1095. I, I'm recording now, so I really hope that was true. Yeah, 1095, yes. That's great, that, that's great. So what he asked was, if, if we have pockets of, of monks you know, who are spread throughout doing the great thought, how did their, um, their thoughts, the things that they were coming up with, influence the church as a whole? A and to some degree, sometimes they didn't, sometimes they kind of kept to themselves, um, and what you see any time in history that when people retreat too much, their theology kind of starts to take a left turn because they're not bouncing the ideas off the whole. Some would be sought as great mentors and local official bishops, because the, chur the church was still working in this area, local bishops would go seek the knowledge of the Desert Fathers and it would be incorporated into the life of the church, but you couldn't send an email. That takes time. Part of the problem with theology in the past is there's letters and couriers and sometimes there's bandits that kill you and like, Theology takes, takes some time to happen. So after Nicaea, we're gonna get multiple councils where the church goes, oh, okay, okay, we gotta figure it out. So some of the political factors that got us to the great split, okay, the schism, um, are, are two different ways of doing church governance. Now, what happened was when, uh, when the capital of, of the world, right, Constantine moved the capital to, Con to Constantinople, um, the epicenter of, of political and social decision making shifted over to Asia, shifted over here to Turkey. Um, but the life of the church, being in Latin, uh, was still held very firmly uh, in Italy. Um, so when the Pope decided unilaterally to make this change, the Holy Emperor over here in, in, um, in Constantinople didn't like that decision. Well, if you are of this persuasion, if you're of the Grecian persuasion, uh, and the Orthodox persuasion, they believed that the church should be run by a brethren of patriarchs, that, that the highest level of the church were five bishops who were set throughout the, the known world at this time, and, and even though there was a pope, that pope was the first among equals, that all five of these patriarchs they were all together in that decision making, okay? Just like we have a chair of the elders, um, that's still a body, that's still a group. And even today, your orthodox religions still do church that way. And, you know, we, we actually inherited a little of that here at this church. We have a plurality of leadership. Well, time and space, um, the bishop of Rome, who was one of five bishops, kind of started to see himself as the, the most important. He was called Pope, he was the first of those brothers, um, but when the rest of the brothers over here said, no, we don't wanna do this, um, the Pope did it anyway. And so you start to see, that's when Rome, that's when the Catholic Church really established itself from the Orthodox Church, because the Pope, it's a, it was all about where does authority come from? Now, now I'm gonna get us to the Crusades because this split matters. 
So they broke fellowship, they broke communion. They would no longer do communion together. There's still kind of this understanding that yes, they're Christian over there, but over here in the West is where life is really happening. This is where really what's up. So you see this split happen and life, they just start to drift. So much so to the point that um, the Orthodox Church, if you really looked at it, just looks different than, than the way do we do church. And there's a lot of other, there were other things that got us there, okay? The Pope didn't just wake up one day and say, I'm, I'm awesome, I'm putting all my power in myself. There were a series of smaller fights that happened over time. For example, um, in, in the early 10s, there was a, a, a great movement here in the Eastern Church to say, hey, we're sinning by having images in church. We're breaking the commandment about images. We gotta get rid of everything. And, and they did. They, they started burning all of the images, which there were a lot of. There's a lot of great art, you know, on the walls and on little, you know, circles that they would hold and walk around with. The East said, we're done with it. We gotta get rid of them. A little misguided, I think, maybe, but four of the five great bishops decided they were going to do that. The West said, no, we're not doing that. We're gonna keep our images. What does that do for you thinking about Rome today? The Catholic Church holds very firmly to, to their DNA that says we do images in our church and that's lasted for a long time. Well that as the delineating factor of who Catholics are, that has its roots all the way back, back there. So this is one of the uh, few things that led us to the point th where the church just said we're done. Now today, the Eastern Orthodox Church, which, which includes, it's a pretty wide umbrella, um, that's actually the second largest single unit religion in the world, well church in the Christian world. There's about 250 million people in the Orthodox religion today. For perspective, there's 1.5 billion, 1.5 to 1.7 billion Catholics. Us Protestants, there's about 800 million of us, but we're splintered into so many groups we don't consider ourselves one monolith. So for one church, the Orthodox uh, community, 250 million, I mean, that's, that's pretty big. So the root cause of this split was authority, but it really did wrap around this, this idea of and the son. And it's three little words. Like, why is that such a big deal? Well, if, if in your context you understand that the, the, the church was getting hammered by, by the Arian heresy, this, this, I mean, this total heresy that Jesus Christ is not, is not God was becoming wildly popular, vastly popular. It was growing faster than, than Orthodox, than proper Christianity was at the time. So the Western church, they're not wrong, right, to say, we have to have this language, this matters. But it's the way that conversation went down that made it matter. Any questions on that before I go too far ahead? I am skipping over a lot of time, but I'm just trying to frame us in on the Crusades. No, th yeah, this is still this is still the view today. Now we got we've gotten better language about the Spirit. Oh yeah, no, the Orthodox they don't. So the Orthodox never believed that the Son was not Creator. They didn't believe that you should put change the creed without everybody's say. And really. They were kind of being um, middle school about it because like the West would write the East a letter and they would wait to respond and they would like wait a couple months to respond just to be petty. I mean, it, it was pretty pathetic how that happened, but I mean, it really was just a fight over authority. So I, I probably couldn't articulate the Eastern Orthodox Creed to you now. I'm sure the internet could help me with that. Um, but it isn't that they believed the Arian heresy they just believe that the Pope doesn't have the right to make a decision of that grand scale, right? Because the creeds, it's not something that we're as connected with at Switzerland Community Church maybe, but the creeds are what make you a Christian because the creeds are what separate you from heretics. The reason why w we could say to, to those of the Aryan persuasion, you're not Christian, is because we all agree on the creeds. Um, there's kind of a, a movement later uh, in the 17 and 1800s to, to say we don't need creeds, um, but you kind of do. You kind of do need the creed because that's synthesizing the entire text of the Bible to be able to say 
this, this is the right interpretation of these words, because some of them are difficult, right? For example, there's a place in the Bible that says Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. Now, within a couple of words, it says he created all things, but one side of that equation is going to put more weight on he's the firstborn. What does that mean? What does that mean that Jesus is the firstborn? If you take that too far, what does that mean? He's created. Yeah. Now, now, we need a creed to synthesize all of the text to say, yes, this is what it says, but we all agree that the right way to interpret that is he has the rights of the firstborn within the family, not that he was the first created. It matters. Um, it, it, the theology of that level matters because it's what separates you from those who believe wrongly. And Paul very clearly taught that there are false Christs, that what you believe about Christ could be wrong. And that probably matters. Now, if you're just some poor Viking, well, I guess they're not Vikings yet, if you're some poor Goth living up here and the only word you ever heard was, was the Aryan view, the church needs to get a handle on that, to get up there and give the right gospel. So have I convinced you why the three little words matter? Actually, in Latin, it's only one word, and it's a very small word. But this rocked the world, right? The, the great foundation that Constantine had, had built, bringing the church out of the shadows and establishing it as this mighty edifice, had broken in two. So the relationship between the two was tenuous at best. They were friendly, they, but they weren't in communion. So, fast forwarding, backtracking, I'm not sure where I'm at in my time. When, when, when Islam started to take over, East and West could both ignore South. Both of them could say, eh, not a big deal. But later, Islam started to grow outside of the Arabic world. So first it just started within the Arab-speaking communities and the desert wanderers, but eventually there was a group uh, of stronger warriors up here in Turkey called the Seljuk Turks. And they weren't Arabs, they were very strong warriors, and they bought on to, to Islam as well. And so what they brought was a military efficiency and a cross-cultural reality that Islam didn't have before, right? Bef before the Seljuk Turks got involved, Islam was kind of, that's just a weird thing happen happening down in Saudi Arabia. Now it has worldwide implications. Um, this is right before the Crusades, so late 900s. Yep, this is getting us right up to the, to the Crusades. So the Seljuk Turks, when they caught the vision, they conquered, let me get green, I need more colors. So all this, all this is conquered by Islam. All of that, all of Saudi Arabia. Well, the Seljuk Turks conquered all of this. That is a very different equation, because Constantinople is right there, right? And they're seeing Islam creep. It's, it's growing. And, and now the stories of what Islam had done to the poor Syriac Christians who we'd been ignoring, now those stories start to matter. Now we lose Jerusalem and Antioch and Ephesus, and now we're at the very heart of the Christian world. Now that starts to become a lot more important. Now, Islam, previous to this, had come up this way and conquered southern Spain and had created a little empire there that some history books will tell you was very peaceful. If you read about this, this area, um, this is the Andalusian Empire when, when Islam had conquered Spain. And it's this, according to some history books, it's this golden age of peace that, that uh, as, as Islam ruled there, everyone could live freely. Well, maybe not everybody was beheaded, uh, but you would be if you evangelized. So Christians could live there, they just couldn't be Christians in reality. And they had to forcibly pay their tithe. So yes, it might not be the same kind of bloodshed that we're gonna see over here, but it is far from this golden age of peace, right? Um, and, and they had started to creep over this way uh, into, into Europe, and Europe barely, barely pushed them back. Yes? Th 
with this group, no. Um, down here, to, to a greater extent, it was. Um, this group is kind of an offshoot of the main guys down here. Islam is experiencing its own schism during this time. Um, so, but, but no, the Christians weren't forced to wear burqas here. Now down here, um, there was a lot of that. There were laws such as a uh, Christian, uh, if you're, if you couldn't own a horse, first of all, you could only own a donkey, and uh, if uh, your Islamic overlords came towards you on their horse, you had to step off your donkey and wait for them to pass. This was the norm. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you guys a great book to read on this topic afterwards if you're interested. But what I want you to get is this growing fear that's happening as Islam is starting to sandwich in um, the, the, the world of, of Europe. That, you know, you're not getting 24-hour CNN coverage, so you're only hearing about this in small bits over years. But, but Islam is really starting to grow. So what happened was the emperor here in Constant Constantinople put out a plea to, to Rome and said, hey, we need help. They are at our doorstep. They are, they have, they're going to conquer us. We need you. So the pope uh, in Rome, in, in either a good idea or a bad idea, reached out to Europe and said, hey, we have to save our brothers. Understand that, that that is the context of the Crusades. They started by saying, we have to free our brothers from having been conquered. Now, the original agreement between East and West is that Europe would come, free the lands that had been taken over, not, not all of these lands, because, again, they're, they're, they never cared about the Syriacs, but just these lands that were owned by the Byzantine Empire, the original agreement was, we're going to give you back those lands. That was the agreement. Now, it spiraled off from there. I'm not trying to say that Christians didn't do bad things, okay? But I want us to get a good framework of what, why the Crusades happened. Is that a stretch or an arm? Okay, that's a stretch. So one thing that happened for the first time ever um, is, is the Pope during this time, as he calls out to, uh, to Europe to, to go on this crusade, um, is for the first time ever was offered what's called a plenary indulgence. Does anybody know what, what a plenary indulgence is? Close. Yeah. That occupation would have been something we need to go rectify this. Had that taken place? Everywhere? Yeah. Jerusalem had been conquered for a good long time by the time this plea for help went out. But, um, but no one. No. Nobody, they just said, Let's go. Nope. The early Christians were, were less concerned with that than, than probably even we are today. Um, you have to understand the kind of rampant anti Semitism that, that was happening in Europe at the time um, because of. I think probably all of, all of the energy Rome put into punishing the Jews and Christians got caught up in that. There was this big step away from the early Christians to say, we are not Jewish. Um, so you would think, kind of from our eyes, that the first time Jerusalem was conquered, hey, we gotta go get Jerusalem. But it just didn't happen. It didn't happen. Now that, that is gonna be a rallying cry later, but that didn't set us up. So the plenary indulgence. So within the Catholic system, you know, after, after you die, and, and let's say you are headed to heaven, you gotta do your time in purgatory. Purgatory, you get, you get all the, the rest of your sins kind of burned away from you to prep you to be in heaven. And, and Catholic doctrine has changed over the years, whether that's like seven years, or I've read as much as 15,000 years. I don't know where they pull the numbers from, but, you know, but, but you're gonna spend a ton of time uh, uh, in purgatory. Well, the Pope, having the keys to the kingdom, right, according to Catholic theology, had the ability to say, if you go on this crusade, I will give you a free pass. Total release from purgatory, not from hell. You still gotta be Catholic. You still have to be in the Catholic system. It's a very different theology than ours, but total freedom from purgatory. Yes? Yeah. 
Yes, well, so you're talking about down here or Andalus? Yeah, so 100% um, money was a big factor, and I'm getting there. Um, so, so let me back up. If you are a nominal Christian or a kind of Christian, or you're only a little bit interested in, in Catholicism, when you get this offer of, of the free pass, people who maybe didn't care that much now care a lot more. Um, and it's because there were other interests involved. I mean, the, the, the trading routes for silk and spices and slaves were, w had a stronger impact on them than probably like this, this pious idea of we need to go rescue Jerusalem. Like we can't put two uh, rosy colored lenses on our view of, of the world. There was still plenty of corruption, still people mostly just out for themselves. So that colors, I think, the difference between who, who the crusaders were. They weren't all, hey, these are the, the best Christians of our day. It was just kind of everybody, right? Like, why wouldn't you go? And, and I think that distinction matters. It, it wasn't the most pious folk. It was anybody could get, get in on this Catholic gig, um, which probably speaks more to Catholic doctrine having a problem with indulgences than it probably does of, of Christianity as a, as a whole. Does that make sense? Is everyone kind of tracking? Again, that matters. So I, I say, you know, I want to be patient with my brothers and sisters through time of, of our Christian brothers and sisters, but I don't internalize a lot of that, that crusade guilt because I would say, yeah, there's a problem with the indulgences. Yeah, you probably shouldn't do that. This is the craziest thing that can happen if you offer indulgences, you shouldn't do it. Do you have a question? Okay, uh, are we, yes? So, were plenary indulgences a, a new thing, almost like a new recruitment tool by the Pope? Right, so indulgences existed before yeah. at smaller degrees. You could get some years off your time. But a full indulgence, which lasts for your past sins and your future sins, mm -hmm. that was new. That was revolutionary. Yep. Um, if you believe in any indulgences whatsoever, I guess that's the next, lo next logical step. Yeah, so before, and, and of course this issue, this indulgence issue, this will be the thing that makes Martin Luther who he is in about 500 years. This is the issue he fights against. Isn't there really indulgences? Initially? No, I can, I can find that for you, but I, I don't have that now. I'm just trying to get us to the Crusades. So also understand, um, again, as, as we look back at history, people who, who probably don't care a lot about Christianity and, and just want to have a reason to talk bad about Christianity, as they look backward, there's a broad stroke brushed over all of the, the Western and Islamic clashes that happened over many hundreds of years. A crusade is a very specific piece of what was hundreds of years of fighting. Okay, a, th there were three major crusades, which is very specifically the Pope saying, we're going to go accomplish this thing and be done. The West was not going to go with the intention of taking over all of this land. The original intention was to rescue it, give it back to Constantinople, and be done. Yes? No, different Popes. Yes, yes, absolutely that was the case, yeah. And I don't think there was a goal of reunification. It, it, it just seemed to kind of be a, this is the right thing to do. It started that way. Now, now why are the Crusades so bad on the Christian end? Because they did that. They did great. They got to Constantinople, liberated it, and, and that went really well. Then they got to Antioch, and... and uh, it was a little tougher, and then they fought their next battle, and they fought a little harder, and by the time they got done, they could pretty much see Jerusalem, and they're like, wow, let's just keep going, and by the time they got to Jerusalem, the good idea fairy bit them that said, hey, let's also camp out and stay here, 
And so what you see is this kind of, uh, they got more and more impassioned. Now that didn't happen in a vacuum. So when they got to um, the second big campaign, which was Antioch, uh, let me find my notes, I'm sorry. So at Antioch, um, so Constantinople went great. They knocked it out, they did really well. They got to Antioch, a big walled city, and they laid siege to it, right? And so a siege being like, we're camping outside your walls until you starve or open up. Um, well, that wasn't going really well. Antioch was pretty well fortified. Um, eventually, this dude comes on the scene, uh, Peter was his name, and he allegedly found the spear that pierced Jesus' side, okay? Uh, finding the relics of the faith was very popular back then, right? Like every little church had a piece of a splinter of the true cross. You know, Calvin said if, if all of the splinters of the true cross were put together, it would sp span all of Europe, right? Because um, everybody claimed to have one. Relics were very important. Constantine's mother um, was obsessed with finding the relics of the cross, uh, almost to a supernatural, you know, kind of superstitious bent. Um, she had uh, supposedly the nails that were driven into to Christ pounded into Constantine's armor to make him immortal. I mean, you know, kind of these weird superstitious beliefs. Don't judge too harshly. We have weird superstitions too. Well, at least I, I hear that. Our, our bulletins are very superstitious. It's a joke, come on, that's funny. <laughs> so he found the spear, and, and supposedly this Peter guy, upon finding the spear, this, um, from it would come the miracle of, of emptying Antioch and, and winning the siege, and it did. They shouldn't have been able to break the siege, but they did, they broke into Antioch uh, and were starting to take it over, and then they found themselves besieged by reinforcements from, from the Islamic armies. So now they're inside the city and all they have is the hope of, of the spear to get them through and miraculously uh, they, they, they beat two sieges, one inside and one outside. And they kind of attributed it to God uh, was buying into their plan through providing them with the, the spear. I don't buy the spear thing, but you know, it, you just have to point at it and say that that's what they did. And again, w w Christians throughout time have done this. Even in the Bible, right? Uh, there was the time where Moses held up the, the bronze serpent and said, you know, if you look at this, you'll be saved. If you don't, you die. Well, at some point we read in the Bible, like they had to get rid of that thing because God's people were using that as an idol. So that's just something in our, in our human hearts to, to, to do that. So we can't be too hard on them. So they, 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 uh, they, they, they win the siege at Antioch, and then they remember in the original call that the Pope put out, um, in the original call to the Crusades, he mentioned Jerusalem. He didn't say, go get Jerusalem, but it was kind of like, for the sake of Jerusalem, we should do this. Well, they took that, went a little crazy with it, and they kept going. And this is where the problem started, because the further they got away from the original call of just handing over the lands, the more human greed and human passion started to take over what probably could have been an okay thing. If we'd stuck to our guns, handed over the land and left, like we probably wouldn't be dealing today with what we deal with when the Crusades are brought up and, and you know, the common parlance. So they got to Jerusalem and what started to impact their theology, again, this is a plea for why theology matters, um, was this idea that they were bringing the apocalypse that the Christians, in conquering Jerusalem, in taking back the land, that they would give it back to Christ and they would win revelation. Like, that's, that's what started to be a belief. So you have two factors. You have the greed and the power, and you have the kind of fanaticism that's disconnected from what the church is really telling them should happen, and they say, we're gonna get to Jerusalem and we're going to make it a state. And that's, I mean, now we're totally in the wrong place. Now we're, we're completely off the path of where the Crusades, now it's about taking and holding rather than returning. And in doing so, um, Jerusalem then becomes the football that goes back and forth. The Christian world digs in on the idea now um, that says, now we must hold Jerusalem. Now Jerusalem matters. Um, I mean, to this day, right, there, there's a, a 
the giant golden mosque sitting on the Temple Mount. And, and I mean, how much of American politics is based around the idea somewhere that Jerusalem is something we should value. And there are roots of the Crusades in that. So the, the reason the Western world gets a lot of pushback from, from Islam is part of this idea, this, this same back and forth of, of using the land as a football um, has its roots. But for some reason, Islam has kind of gotten a pass on the 400 years before the Crusades where they were cutting off the heads of all the Christians who were just kind of hanging out in the desert. Um, which I don't think is fair, but that, you know, that's just kind of where we are. Um, any questions on that stuff? Can we, do we feel more confident about why the Crusades happened? We can't ever say that nothing bad happened. There was killing of women and children, okay? There was stealing and, and bad deals of land, and there, 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 all of these things were part of it. But what I want us to get is that I, I don't think Christianity started that fight. I really don't. Um, Islam led by the sword, and that really mattered. Um, yes? Wasn't the politics involved in that was so that the Jewish Christians, the seat of the Lord and everything, wanted to get rid of the red son? Well, yes, yes. So a couple of things with, with feudalism. So this idea that, that the feudal lords would you know, have control over their lands and would have to parcel out their lands to their sons, this was expansionistic. So, but, but Jerusalem itself started to be its own kingdom. So you couldn't just, Europe couldn't just parcel out that land. But to say to your younger son, go get some, yes. Also, chivalry had a really weird impact on the Crusades. The chivalric system, right, chivalry, the code, gave you this, this romantic ideal of, of fighting for the right reasons, only bloodshed, you know, in the right way, in the right manner. Um, you had all these really well-trained, well-armed fighters w with no one to fight anymore because chivalry had locked them into uh, almost a, a weird pacifism. Now they're told, hey, but you can go crazy out there. And they did. I mean, there was this kind of unleashing. The, the, the end result of chivalry was <laughs> all of those violent tendencies were, were unleashed. And it's almost like this weird Lord of the Flies thing that happened out there. You see um, these orders of knights pop up, right? The, the Knights Templar and the Knights Hospitaller. These orders, uh, the, the, so the Knights Templar were a group of guys who got to the Temple Mount and said, we, ha we, must, we must keep this place sacred. We will hold it. And this, this order of knights, which knighthood used to be, I'm connected with a lord here in, here in Europe and I'm gonna protect his honor and protect, now it's focused on the land. The Knights Templar grew in kind of power and mysticism. The Knights Hospital are a group of guys who said, hey, um, it's, there are gonna be lots of normal people, not fighters, who are gonna wanna start making pilgrimages here to Jerusalem. We now exist to let them get there. Um, so they became, became this like courier service, a, a bodyguard service as, as women and children would wanna make pilgrimages to, to Jerusalem. You see these orders of knights, which were connected to the feudal system, now be connected to external ideals, uh, and, and that becomes dangerous, right? Because if you don't have a Lord directing you, you're just kind of directed by yourselves. The church takes on this uh, uh, unconnected with what's happening in Rome, this kind of ferocity. So Christianity's reputation is, is now being championed by the Knights Templar who aren't really connected with Rome. That's a problem especially when the whole, our Christianity's whole concept up to this point is, hey, let's be unified, let's be together. Now, by the point of the sword, we have ultimately these gangs roaming around, amassing their own power, and, and so there is a chaos that, that does happen. So we can't, Christianity as a whole can't be excused from the Crusades, but certainly um, I hope we can explain to people who we come across, okay, hold on, we did not throw that first punch. Any other questions? I've got about... Yes. Are you going to get into the New Earth tonight or the New Earth questions or both? We're not. Not tonight. I wanted to get us to the kind of the foot of the of the Crusades. Um, yeah. But that is a good conversation. Yes, Steve. Okay. Do you think it really came to Africa and Asia and Africa? Oh, 
Well, I don't know. I can get that for you, but I don't, I don't think I have that off the top of my head. Yes? Correct, yeah, the Orthodox. But now you've got like the Russian Orthodox Church, which is very iconic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it didn't last long. Okay, so they went back. Yeah, that period of okay. I iconoclasm, uh, which is the idea of destroying icons, that was actually very short. And, and that, that's happened, it happened in Switzerland, so actual Switzerland. Switzerland. Yeah, it, what you do see from that point on, though, is Eastern art style start to change drastically. Um, at that point, you'll see Western art style. Uh, I think I've talked about this before. All of the pictures, like if you see, would see Jesus and the disciples, in, in Western art, they're looking at each other, right? Their eyes are either looking at the scene or they're talking to each other. And in Eastern art, um, their eyes are focused out to the audience. Very different. What the Eastern tradition of art is trying to tell you is like you're connected with the past. How how is Jesus connecting with you? How is you know uh, Constantine connecting with you? That you're part of the church. Meanwhile, the West is more saying like hearken back to the time that that this thing happened. So a weird shift starts to happen in the art, which I think is interesting. Still lasts today, in general. Good question. What else? Yes. Yeah. How is, how is the Orthodox dealing with the crusades at this time? Do you have any stats? Yeah, um, they're mostly getting beat up, and they don't they, they, they start to lose the military might um, that they had. Uh, there's a lot of the, a lot of them had been subjugated like this way by by the Turks by the Seljuk Turks. Um, yeah. So as far as what happened all the way over here. Um, Mm -hmm. China, yeah, Christ Christianity in the far, far east gets snuffed out. Um, uh, Islam is going to go that way. Buddhism is going to kind of come out as more formal. Uh, so Hinduism is also going to be more formal. Um, and in China and, and Japan, Christianity is almost snuffed out to nothing. Although in Shintoism today, um, which is a, a Japanese cultic religion, they actually, one of their spirits that they worship is the Virgin Mother and her son that they kind of incorporated into their religion, which is fascinating. But because th that link had been lost, you know, th that limb died, that limb fell off. So then the Orthodox Church is kind of, has always been since that time, kind of intermixed with the Islam, and they've all been kind of sort of, because the Russia never got really Islamic, it's never. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it kind of just stays Islam, so then there's... Yeah. So, or, so orthodoxy did, did kind of run. I mean, ultimately, it did push this way. Um, and, and it just went on by itself. So th there really wasn't any great connection between the two until 2004, between Rome and, and, uh, and the East. There was, there was no connection between the two at all. It was just they're over there. And kind of the, the accusation of, oh, you're Westocentric, right? Christianity is so, so Eurocentric. Well, that's because... We've only been paying attention because because Rome broke communion with the East. Yeah, we we lost connection with the West. All of the developments. Because we went from there back. Right. So this way. so the Reformation kind of acts like it was the first time that anyone ever broke away from Rome. Actually, untrue. We just had had ignored what was going on, and and really because of internet and and the telegraph, and I mean the last hundred and fifty years the ability to communicate is a lot faster, and so there's a lot more of, of those communications happening than ever did before. Um, but we were really focused on the Reformation for a long time. I mean, that, I mean, Luther changed at least our half of the world. Um, and then the South, I mean, forget about it, but y we, we talk about how old the Catholic Church is or how old the Constant Constantinople is. You go to the Somalian Church, and they laugh at us because they've been there hiding out by themselves the whole time with an unbroken line all the way back to the point where Philip runs into the, into the man from Ethiopia, right? Like the Somalian church 
has been going on. But what you see is, is our theologies just start to veer just a little bit. Like I say all the time, the American church, other than the branch that is Pentecostalism, we don't pay enough attention to the Holy Spirit. I mean, for the most part, the, the Baptists and the, and the Presbyterians, like we just, we don't teach. You go to the Eastern church, they have a much more refined conversation about the Holy Spirit. Let's say it's better, you know, or worse, but, but kind of the, the flavor of, of the Christianity as they start to branch off, th- they've done that. I mean, we are way more text-centric on, on the text of the Bible than the Somalian church or, or the Eastern church, a lot more. That, that to us, and, and you know, that's something that we really got from Luther, but that is what flavors our Christianity. Their Christianity is flavored differently, and I'm not gonna make a comment on whether or not they're saved, that's a different conversation, but it's a different flavor for sure. Good question. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, the Somalian church, interestingly enough, built churches underground. Like, literally, they built down instead of up. Um, not like caves. Like, they dug a big plot, and then they built a church in it, which is interesting. But, yeah, Christianity had to do that. And, and, and the Islamic subjugation is very real. Um, you know, there's these stories of how, how Baghdad during the Middle Ages was, was this, you know, the first renaissance. They invented math. They invented science. Um, we're getting archaeology now that's showing it, it was their Jewish slaves that were teaching them <laughs> how to do astronomy and, and math. Um, so there's a really great book. It's called uh, Lost History of Christianity, uh, The Lost History of Christianity by a guy named Philip Jenkins. And he really focuses in on the plight of the Syriac Christians um, and how we abandoned them we, because their theology wasn't perfect um, and, and all, all that was lost through, the, through that time. Um, our connection with the land that, that, you know, because there was really an unbroken line even through, even through the Roman tragedies when, when Rome was killing Christians and Jews, there was an unbroken uh, uh, holding of the land until, until the Islamic invasion which was a big deal. The Islamic invasion, coincidentally enough, is where we get the legend of Dracula. Anyone know that story? That's in the 1300s, but Vlad the Impal- Impaler all by himself held back the, the Islamic warlords. That's a great story. I'll have to tell that one another time, though. But the theme for about 500 years is Europe just being like holding off, trying to, to keep Islam back because Islam is ever-expanding. It, it, uh, especially the Shia sect, which is, is different than the Sunni sect, it is an apocalyptic religion that they will bring about the end of days by subjugation. That is, that is a requirement. They will subjugate the world. You will be under, uh, under the will of Allah with your head on or not, but you're going to be. Um, and, and that is a constant push. Um, I'm not an interpreter of, of Islam. I, I am a... I have experienced a lot of radical Islam firsthand, um, but that is a constant theme, is that we're bringing about the apocalypse. Well, we did that too. We said we, we're going to bring about the apocalypse by cleansing the Holy Land. You know, cleansing probably just not a great philosophy in general. Like, let's let Jesus do that, I think, himself. That's, that's the pastor in me, not the historian uh, in me. Any other questions? Um, so they were wiped out pretty early. Uh, Alexandria, um, we lost a lot from that time. And we were breaking communion with Alexandria um, because of some theological grounds that they wanted to stand on that, to them, the northern church didn't want to stand on. Be, be, um, yeah, so probably don't have a lot of time for that explanation. But yes, I mean, that... that the, the, we just kind of started to retreat from anything south of, of Europe. We just did. We had to. Um, and anybody who was left there was kind of left to die uh, during that time. And a lot of that, I mean, the Western world never won back. Okay. Um, I think.
think that's our time. Um, so next week uh, is Super Bowl, and then Ryan will be back on the 12th. Um, so let me, let me pray, and we'll, we'll go have lovely evenings. Lord, we thank you so much, God, that uh, you, your promises are sure that we um, stand on a foundation not of the work of any man, but through the work of Christ. And uh, we're grateful, Lord, that you will sustain your church. Um, and we just pray that you would, you would help us and guide us, that hopefully in 2,000 years someone's not looking back at us and saying how, how silly they are, but that we're guided by you, Lord, with humility uh, and with grace. Um, I pray for all of those here and, and those in our body who aren't here, Lord, that you would uh, sustain us through this week, that you would um, give, us, give us your word and your calling in our lives, Lord, and um, that you would um, help us in, our, in every day. So we thank you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.